of our four-part series leading up to Easter, uh, we're particularly looking at communion. And the passage that we've focused on is the passage from um, Luke 22. Um, I'm just going to say one verse out of it. Now, I am going to be quoting scripture from all over the place. I'll tell you where it is, um, and I'll quickly find it. You don't need to find it, but you will need to follow it. Okay. Uh, so, let's, let's, let's pray. Right, Father, thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you, um, well, I would not like to thank you for the way you spoke to me as I prepared this time. And for the great blessing that this the truth that you are teaching us is. It's a wonderful thing. So I pray, Father, that you would use my mouth to share that blessing to everybody here. We want to know you more. And we're so grateful for all you've done. Um, so come and fill us now. And just yeah, use this time to bring glory and honour to your name. Amen. 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 So the passage, so the bit that I've been given, I'm looking, uh, we're looking at communion, I'm focusing on the bread. So um, the bit, the, past, the verses. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, Clive, Clive started by introducing, okay, by introducing this um, whole topic by talking about the old and new covenant last week, and he spent a lot of time um, helping us to understand the wonderful new covenant we've come into. But um, I would like to use a particular ver uh, oh, a couple of verses out of Romans, just to again highlight what the new covenant is. So. Romans 10, this is, a, for those of you who have been Christians a long time, it's a very famous couple of verses. Um, let me just read them to you. Okay, so starting at verse 8. But what does it say? So this is um, the message. Okay, so what's, what's the good news about this? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart. That is the word of faith we're proclaiming. But if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him, Jesus, will never be put to shame. For there will be no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is the good news. That is the good news. It is not by works. It is not by being clever. It is not anything that we can do ourselves. The good news is, anyone, everyone who calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. And that means we're all in. All we have to do is turn to him and say, I want you. I want you in my life. Save me. I need you. There is nothing more. And that is amazing. All the things we've ever done wrong, all the things that have ever gone pear-shaped in our lives, anything. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to stress and think that somehow we've got to put it right or sort it out before I can come into God's presence because Jesus has done it. He's paid the price. He's sorted it out. That is what the message is. He died. He suffered. He was buried. But he rose again. And all we have to do is believe. To trust him. Not this notion of faith that somehow is this type of almost noun where we go, you know, ooh, people of faith, as though that some way it's like saying people of Germany or people of France. It's not a description in that sense. When the Bible's talking about faith, it's talking about a conscious act on our part, a choice, a decision. We will believe. 
even if inside of me I feel insecure, even if I'm scared, even if I'm uncertain, I choose to believe. And anyone who believes in Jesus will be saved. So, why in this wonderful good news did Jesus set up this? Why set up communion? What was it about? Okay, I talked about the reality, but movement from the old covenant to the new covenant. Jesus was just about to bring us into the new covenant. But why bother with this? In one sense, you know, he could have done all that without communion. So why was this set up? Why did he reference this whole bit about this is my body and next week this is my blood? What's the point? So to understand this, we need to understand three things. Okay? We need to understand some of the history of the Jewish nation. We need to understand about the food that was eaten at the time. And we need to understand what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about his body. So I'll talk about those three things and we'll just, I'll share with you what those three things are. Okay? So, the history of the Jewish nation, food of the time, and what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about his body. So let's deal with the history. So the history then is all written down for us in, um, in the Bible. So the, the bit I want to just highlight is in Exodus. So if you're actually reading the Bible, then Exodus 12. And I'm just going to start at verse uh, 21. Now... Just so we're clear, most of us know this story, just in case anybody doesn't. We're talking now about when the Israelites who were in Egypt, God took them out of Egypt. And this story is where Moses is telling them what to do to prepare to go and to actually go out of Egypt, how they are going to leave. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out to the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame, and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and to strike you down. <clears throat> Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and for your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as a promise, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. The Passover was a real event. It happened. The, Egypt, the Israelites left Egypt. But they were in the desert then for 40 years. And all the adults of that generation died because they rebelled against God. So the people who went into the promised land were the children. Now, I'm not being funny, but if you ask me what I was doing 35 years ago, I might struggle. I can't actually remember what I was doing on this Sunday, or the equivalent Sunday, 35 years ago. Is there anybody in the room? There are some people with eidetic memories. Can, is anybody in the room remember? Uh, yeah. April. April. April the 7th. What were you watching? I was in my there you go. See, Dave's one of those people. They're in Japan. There you go. See, so they're much better than me. Oh, it's Birdie. Oh, yeah. So, how are we going to remember such an important thing? How does it get passed on? Not so that it becomes a story in a book that the children read but it's part of their very existence, their day-to-day -day lives. Where you remember it every single year. You celebrate it. You set around it a pattern 
uh, uh, almost a custom and practice. So this is what we do on this day, right? Why do you do that, Dad? Because of this. Let me tell you the story. And you tell the story again. And then every year you tell the story again. And we know this is true because we have children who all enjoy Christmas and they ask you what Christmas is about, you talk about Christmas, and whether you're a Christian or not, or not then you have a traditional Christmas story and you have a family tradition of how Christmas is done. And this is what we do, and this is when we set the decorations up, and this is when we put the tree up, and this is when we open the presents, and so on. And we set up patterns. So Moses, God, wanted from all the coming generations the fact that the Israelites were brought out of Egypt to be remembered. Why? Because it was his love gift. He chose the Israelites. He wanted them to know that out of all the nations, he had chosen them. They were special. They were his people. He loved them. And these were the lengths to which he was prepared to go to set them free. And he wanted not just the adults who were there, who saw it, who experienced it with themselves, by themselves, but he wanted all the children down all the generations to know that truth. So he set up the Passover. Now wrapped up in the Passover there was all the covenant stuff that Clive was talking about last week, all the the foreshadowing of what was to come, Jesus' life and everything else. They didn't know it at the time. We look back now and we can understand. But the key message at this moment was, remember. That's exactly what Jesus was doing. Remember. We are 2,000 years old. How much do we remember on a daily basis of the way that people used to live? How much do we remember the way that our ancestors lived in Britain 2,000 years ago? We don't. In fact, we do archaeological digs and write books about what we find. We don't remember it. But in this one act, Jesus helped us to remember. It's not just a story, because I've had communion hundreds of times. I've experienced it. It is part of who I am. And every time we take communion, it becomes another part of who I am. It becomes part of my memory, my experience, my life. I remember that Jesus did this. It's not a story from 2,000 years ago. It's the communion I took last Sunday. It's the communion I'm going to take this Sunday. I remember. And with it, I remember everything associated with it. Oh, hopefully, much of it. So Jesus knew what he was doing. He wanted to link clearly his sacrifice with Passover. And he wanted people to remember what he was doing and why he was doing it. You know, we can remember historical facts, 1066 and all that. But he also wanted us to remember something much, much more. Because if I think about the Battle of Hastings, I have no emotional attachment to it at all. To be honest, to be honest, a bit of history, something happened. I don't think about a soldier who died. Now, if we talk about D-Day, that's very different. Because my dad was on in D-Day. And he was on the second wave of boats that hit the shore. And he told me about D-Day. And it still upsets me. And that's from the memory that my dad told me. And the impact it had on him. Now I'm there with that. Because that actually, I saw it from my dad's eyes. And I heard it in his voice. And I saw what it did to him. 
And I saw that the only way he could be healed was by God coming on him and healing him. But all that happened. Jesus has given us this because he wanted. How does, how does somebody remember their touch? They taste. They see. They hear. We engage our feelings, our emotions, and our tactile senses. Because this isn't about a historical event or just about a historical event. This is somebody saying, I love you. And not with a quiet sound, although that's the way he spoke. The love you that Jesus said echoes through the generations and through history. It was one of the loudest cries ever to be said. Because the sound dissipated, but it is the finish. This continues to echo on. It is finished. This is my body. Broken, not for the Jews who lived around him or just there. This is my body, broken for you. I died on the cross for you. For you. This is a love gift. A love gift we want us all to remember. And this was the way he could help us to feel it. To touch it. To taste what that love was like. To get some understanding. He wanted us to remember to experience it. But, okay, why pray? Why? why? Why did Jesus choose bread? Well, to understand why he chose bread, I need to um, explain a little bit about the food of the time. So, uh, I did my research, printed out my bit. Let me read you this. So this is taken from a food, you know, a book that talks about the food of um, <coughs> the Israelites at the time. Bread was the essential basic food. So basic that the word in Hebrew to eat bread and to have a meal was the same thing. So when they said, I'm going to have dinner, what they were actually saying was, I'm going to eat bread. That's how basic it was. So when we tend to think, oh yeah, meat and two eggs, they went, bread. I'm going to have breakfast, bread. I'm going to have lunch, bread. I'm going to have tea, bread. They didn't have potatoes. They didn't have rice, not easily available. They didn't have other forms of, of carbohydrate. This was their carbohydrate. This was their energy. No bread, die. You stop there. This was their food. Bread was treated with great respect, and many rules existed to preserve that reverence. Any crumb of over the size of an olive was expected to be gathered. Why did the disciples gather up the bread and fish after, after the um, feeding of the 5,000? Because bread was important. We, we treat food with such disrespect this is life. That piece of bread on the floor could feed somebody, could keep somebody alive. So you gather it up. You find out there's 12 baskets and scratch your head and go, how on earth did that happen? Because, you know, what's, what's going on? Bread was never cut. It was always broken. The poor ate barley bread the rich, the bread of wheat. Barley or wheat grains were ground between two millstones, almost always by women, and this was done at home. And from this, the flour, and then the dough was made and worked in kneading troughs. To make the heavy barley bread rise, women used very strong millets and barley yeast. And the loaves were usually made round, such that one spoke of a round of bread. 
or simply a ram. Because bread could, uh, would become mouldy so soon, people would only bake bread enough for a day or two at a time. <coughs> Bread was life. Bread was every day. Every single meal, after the Jew, after the disciples, after the Passover meal, <coughs> every single one, this is my body broken for you. Every time they ate. Breakfast, dinner, tea. This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat it, do it in remembrance of me. That's why communion was part of the meal, because that was the meal. I tend to think, yeah, if I'm having a meal and somebody gave me bread, I'd probably go home. Mm. <laughs> because we treat it with such disrespect. Bread's the thing you leave when they give you a bun at the start of a meal. Like, you, know, you don't want to fill up too much, you'll leave the bun on the side and you'll leave the, the, make the food you want. <coughs> For them it was life. So when Jesus said, um, God chose bread, he was choosing the everyday. Everything he, people would see, every day. Remember, remember. Tell it to your children, remember. Remember, I love you. This is how much I love you. Remember. So that's why bread. And Jesus went one step further, didn't he? He actually said, I am the bread of life. And that was before communion. So he was reminding us of that helping us to remember that actually man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If we need sustaining, he's the sustainer. So he chose bread. It was a very wise choice. What about the body? Well, again, let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12. So, uh, I mean, it's a very long passage. I won't read it all straight off. Let's just do t verse 12. The body is a unit, though it's made up of many parts. <coughs> From though all its parts are many, they form one body. So, okay. So it is with Christ. Okay. Let's go on um, to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. This was a letter to the Corinthian church and Paul makes this statement. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. Go back again. The unit, the body is a unit though it is made up of many parts and though all its parts are many they form one body. He said this is my body because he wanted to help us to understand that this isn't about just me and Jesus. It's not about you and Jesus. Although, <coughs> to some extent it is. It isn't just about that. It is about us and Jesus. When we take the bread and wine, he wants us to remember it's us. He didn't die just for me. He died for you as well. The interesting thing here is, by the way, Jesus never says, oh, it's for the Baptists, or the Coptic church, or the Anglicans. He never envisaged that. He envisaged one body, us. Because he wasn't looking at organizations, he was looking at people. He deals with us as people. This is my body. On a very real level, I mean the symbolism is brilliant because 
even quite analytical scientific minds can get carried away with the analogy. It's a wonderful analogy. Because of course, we take the bread. We eat the bread. The bread goes into us. All starts out as one loaf. It goes into us. We digest it. We take the chemicals. We build ourselves with it. We actually make parts of our body with it. It becomes me. Part of me is made from communion bread. Part of you, if you've taken communion in the past, is made from communion bread. Maybe just a few atoms here or there. Depends how many times you've taken it. The bread and you are now the same. You literally are that body. Wonderful. So clever. Way beyond the science of knowledge of his time. <laughs> us together. We can't manage by ourselves. I want to you to, to, to put forward a very scary thing at this precise time. Right? Look around the room. Oh! <laughs> everybody who is, so just a minute, everybody who's a Christian in this room is part of the body of Christ. Everybody who's a Christian in this room has Jesus in them. And whenever that person gets up your nose, really annoys you, you don't really understand them, whether they're your best friend or the person you never talked to, Jesus is in all of them. All of us. If we're Christian. So in each of us, we should be able to see Christ. And it's only together that we actually see him. It's not about seeing him in a person, the leader, the groups of leaders, the person you like, the person you feel most attached to. Actually, there he is, in the person who you least like, you least understand, and you least get. Is that the same? If they're a Christian, the Holy Spirit's in them, Jesus is there. Working his way out. Same for all of us. Now, Paul, he, you know, Peter said some of the stuff he writes is complicated. Some of the stuff he writes is complicated. Some of the stuff he writes is tremendous. Wonderful stuff. Stuff we hear time and time again. But it's well worth listening to. So, now let's go back to that passage, 1 Corinthians 12. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, for that we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, Baptist, Anglican, Coptic, Catholic, whatever, Greek Orthodox, we were all baptized into one body and given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it will not for that reason cease to be part of the body. I'm not being funny, but everybody who's ever said to us as a church, I'm leaving, it's irrelevant. They cannot leave. They cannot leave. It is impossible. Right? You, you can, they cannot leave. It's as ridiculous as my foot saying, I'm leaving your head. I've had enough. I'm off. It's not going to happen unless a surgeon does it. You cannot leave. It's a ridiculous statement. What we can say is, I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Now, that's not ridiculous. But I'll tell you what, you can't leave the body. So, it doesn't seem to be part of the body. And if the eye should say, because I'm not, uh, sorry, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. And if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? And if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. We cannot say to the Anglicans, we don't need you. We cannot say to the Catholics, we don't need you. We cannot say to any Christian, if they're living in their own house and never go to a church at all, we don't need you. We cannot say it, because we do. Because they're part of the body. 
And the head cannot say to your feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body seem to be weaker. Let me say this, let me read this again. Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. He said, I love you. But in English, he didn't just say, I love you. He said, I love you. He loves us all. And every time we look at it, we have to remember that actually, he loves us all. Even if I don't particularly like that. To be frank, it doesn't matter. He loves us all. Each time he says it, we remember. We see the bread. We remember. We see he is the life. Life in all its colors. So, this is my body, broken for you. Wonderful life, wasn't it? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Every day, if I choose to, I can go to um, the cupboard, see the bread, and I can remember Jesus loves me. He died for me. I no longer have to strive for myself. My sins are forgiven. It's going to be okay. He's in control. He's in charge. It is finished. And he loves me. And do you know what? He loves my friends. He loves those people at church. The ones that don't understand, but he loves us all. And we can all get in. It's okay. We can get through this. And we've got a wonderful message to tell the world. A wonderful message to tell the world. And he said all that for a bun. It's now up to us to take him.